Hi everyone and welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Miri. So uh, what's the deal with 3D rendering? Well, in a nutshell, we have some sort of uh, 3D uh, model or a mesh. For example, this uh, dragon here, a nice little toy that my parents bought for my son. And uh, we want to uh, place the dragon in the 3D world. We want to move it around. And we also want to turn it. And in addition to that, we have a camera which represents the viewer. And we also want to move the camera and um, change its angle. We call this changing the camera's uh, orientation. And remember that the 3D model is composed of a set of vertices that describe its ex exterior. So we want to project the vertices on the, uh, the camera window so that if we move the dragon closer to the camera, it would appear to be bigger. If we move it further away, it will appear to be smaller. And the dragon may also be behind the camera, in which case we expect uh, not to be able to see it at all. So all this means in uh, technical terms is that we need to perform a set of uh, 3D transformations on both the, the object and the, uh, the camera. And uh, these uh, 3D transformations are the topic of uh, this episode as well as a few others. So let's get started. Let's start talking about coordinate systems. I assume that you are familiar with what is called the Cartesian coordinate system. Most people have probably learned this at school at some point. Let's take a look at the image from the Wikipedia page of the system. We'll start with the 2D system. The point where the X and Y axis meet is called the origin and is located at coordinate 0, 0. The X values increase as we move to the right. All the X values here are positive. They decrease as we move to the left and here they are all negative. Same with the Y axis. Increasing and positive as we go up, decreasing and negative as we go down. Every point in that 2D space has a coordinate with the X and Y components. For example, 2 on the X axis and 3 on the Y axis, minus 3 on the X axis and 1 on the Y axis, and etc. Now let's switch to the 3D system. That's the system we are most interested in. We still have the X and Y here, but we've added Z as a third dimension to provide the depth. Some people may be more familiar with Z going into and out of the screen, kind of where the x-axis is located here, but it doesn't really matter. As long as each axis is perpendicular to the other two, we are fine. Actually, this is useful for us because this is exactly how the coordinate system works in Blender, so it's an excellent opportunity to jump into Blender. I've used Blender a while back, but if you haven't seen that video or you're not familiar with Blender, let me just say that Blender is a modeling tool. It enables us to create 3D models of practically every object that you can imagine. These models are also called meshes. A mesh is defined by a set of vertices and the vertices are connected together to form triangles. In most cases, these triangles represent the exterior of the object. All the movements that we can see in a 3D game can be divided into two categories, object movements and camera movements. Let's see an example of an object moving. We can move the box around and we can also make it move only on the x-axis, which is red here, or the y-axis, which is green, or the z-axis, which is blue. The other category is camera movement. For example, I can fly the camera around as if it was a flight simulator. For now, let's focus on the first category, object movements. This category is further divided into three classes of movements. The movement of the box that we just saw is called translation. We are translating the position of the box along one or more of the X, Y, and Z axis. Naturally, if we just translate a subset of the box vertices, we will completely deform the original model. Here's an example. Let's translate this vertex. This is no longer a box. In order to move the model around intact, we have to apply the same translation to the position of all model vertices. Think about how the vertex shader can help us here. The second movement class is called rotation. Here, we are rotating the vertices around an arbitrary point which can be inside the object, in which case the model will appear to be spinning around itself or around some external point. Again, 
we have to apply the same rotation to all the model vertices in order to maintain its integrity. The third and last movement class is called scaling. This causes the object to appear to be growing or shrinking. You may argue that this is not exactly a movement because the object actually stays in the same location, but since the vertices are moving, we still consider this a movement class. Handling all the transformations that are involved in getting a 2D image to appear 3D is quite complex, so we will tackle this step by step. We will learn one transformation at a time and you will eventually see how everything is combined together to achieve the end result. In this video, we are going to focus on translation. At first glance, it seems quite straightforward. We can specify the translation along the X, Y and Z axis in a 3D vector and provide it to the vertex shader. The vertex shader will perform a component-wise addition of the position vector and that translation vector. Since the vertex shader is executed once per vertex of the mesh, the final result will be a translation of the entire mesh. There is nothing really wrong with this approach, except that uh, we usually don't work like this. As we shall see, all the transformations that we need to do to get from a 3D scene down to a 2D window are represented using several matrices. Each matrix is responsible for a single step in the process. Matrices can be multiplied together in order to combine all the transformations into a single matrix, so we have an incentive to represent the translation as a matrix. But before we do that, let's do a quick recap of matrix vector multiplication. If you're already familiar with this topic, you can skip ahead using the time codes in the video description. The core operation in a matrix vector multiplication is the dot product. So first, let's see how to do that. The dot product is an operation between two vectors of equal length. If the two vectors have different number of components, the operation is considered undefined. Here's an example with two 3D vectors. The notation for the dot product is a dot, which we can see here, and for the calculation we simply multiply each component with its counterpart in the other vector, and we add up the results of all these small multiplications. So the dot product takes two vectors as input and outputs a single scalar value. The dot product has many usages, so in addition to matrix multiplication, it can also be used to find the angle between two vectors. Actually, we will take advantage of this in one of the lighting models, but that's a topic for another video. Let's see how to multiply a matrix by a vector. Here we have a 3x3 three three matrix multiplied by a 3D vector. To calculate the result, we need to do a dot product of each matrix row with the vector. So the first element of the resulting vector is obtained by a dot product of the first row in the matrix and the vector. The second element is obtained by a dot product of the second row and the vector, and the third element by a dot product of the third row and the vector. So we multiply the matrix with the vector and the result is a vector of the same length. I hope I convinced you earlier that it will be a good thing if we could represent translation using matrix vector multiplication. The problem is that we cannot find the 3 by 3 matrix that will perform any arbitrary translation of a 3D vector. Try to understand why yourself based on what we just learned on how to multiply a matrix by a vector. Luckily, there is a simple solution. We can add a fourth component to the position vector and put the value of 1 there. We'll construct the translation matrix as we see here, with the translation vector on the fourth column, all ones in the diagonal, and zeros in the remaining cells. If you perform a dot product of every row by the position vector, you will get the translation of the corresponding component by the last value in that row. Here's an example of the first row. We multiply 1 by x, so we get an x. Y and Z are gone because we multiply them by 0, and we add 1 multiplied by V1, so the final result is X plus V1. So that's how we are going to construct translation matrices. By the way, that's the reason why the system variable GL position is a 4D vector and not 3D. The OpenGL spec was designed under the assumption that we will need this component for these kinds of calculations. This component is usually called W, and the XYZ position vector plus W is called homogeneous coordinates. Now that we understand the theory, 
Let's put it in practice in the code. We will start with the way the translation matrix is being constructed. In the render callback, I define the 4D matrix by the name translation. This class is defined in OGL dev underscore math underscore 3D.h, same as the vector that we are already familiar with. Let's take a look. This is a very simple class and the only member is a 2D floating point array with 4 rows and 4 columns. There are a few constructors here, but the one that interests us is the one that takes 16 values and uses them to initialize the 2D array in the same order that they are provided. I used 4 rows and 4 columns here to make the code clearer, but remember that in memory this is simply a buffer of 16 consecutive floating points. Back in the render callback we can see that we call the constructor in the same way that we saw in the translation matrix diagram. We have a diagonal of ones and the last column contains the translation vector. I used scale times 2 for the x and scale for the y. This should make the triangle move faster on the x dimension than on the y dimension. We leave z as 0 for now because we still don't have 3D here. The w component is set to 1 as we said we always should. The call to GL uniform matrix 4FV loads this matrix into the shader. I replace G scale location with G translation location, but this is just a name change. This variable represents the index that synchronizes this C++ matrix with the one in the shader. The second parameter is the number of matrices that we plan to send down to the shader. When you're using many matrices, you have the option to save some API calls by loading them all in a single call. We have a single matrix, so we use one. The third parameter tells OpenGL whether the matrix is row major or column major. We can see the difference between the two modes in this Wikipedia image. When the matrix is row major, it means we are supplying its values first along its rows, and when a row is complete, we move to the next one. In column major, we go first down along the column, and then continue to the right to the next column. In both cases, we start with the top left-hand corner. If this parameter is false, it means column major, and if it is true, it means row major. Since our matrix is row major, we put true here. If you're not sure, simply review the constructor again. The last parameter to this function is the address of the array. Since the function name has matrix 4f inside it, the driver knows it must load 4 times 4 consecutive floating point elements from this address. That's it for the application code. Now let's see the changes in the vertex shader. In the previous tutorial, we used the floating point uniform variable here, and now the type is mat4. This is an internal GLSL type that represents a 4x4 floating point matrix. It is very handy and we will use it often. The value in the translation matrix from the application code ends up here. In the main function, we calculate GL position by multiplying the matrix by the vector. It is critical to do this in this order with the matrix on the left hand side because in matrix vector or matrix matrix multiplication we do a dot product between a row on the left and a column on the right. We could have placed the vector on the left but this would have required us to put the translation vector on the bottom row of the matrix rather than on the rightmost column. It doesn't really matter as long as you are consistent with how you structure your matrices. Another thing we need to notice here is how we expand our VEC3 position vector into a VEC4. In the previous tutorial, we used the VEC4 constructor that takes four parameters. The first three came from the position, the last one was always the value of one. Here we use a different kind of constructor, which takes in the entire vector as the first parameter and the one as the second. Also note that the matrix vector multiplication operator is internal to GLSL, so we can simply use it. Now it's time to build and run. So that was it for translation, that's the first uh, 3D transformation on our list. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it useful. In the next one we will have rotation. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching and I will see you soon.